Let's pray. Our Father, on this Thursday, we come with gratitude and thanksgiving in our hearts. We come, God, thanking you for how you allowed us to sleep last night. And then early this morning, you woke us up. We dare not take it for granted, oh God, that we are still able to stand and walk about and in our right minds. And we thank you, God, because there's so many, so many who are facing challenging times and difficult times. And we are not anywhere better than they are. And so, God, we pray now that you'll bless each and every person on this Zoom at this hour as we're going to be praying for heads of household, praying for healing, praying for salvation, praying for comfort, praying for supernatural intervention, praying for peace, God. I thank you because you said if any two of us can agree as touching anything that we ask for, God, you say you'll do it. So we just ask now your blessings, your peace, and your presence. Holy Spirit, we welcome you at this time. Come and teach us. Come and convict us. Come and comfort us that we may become more like Jesus, more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're talking about what is it that other people are thinking about Jesus? Why is that so important? In John, the 17th chapter, verse 3, it reads, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou has sent. This is eternal life. When we talk about eternal life, this is one of God's most important work he has done for us. And that is to give us opportunity, the second go round, to live eternally. If you go back to Genesis, the third chapter, when Adam and Eve uh, missed the mark, rebelled and disobeyed God, God said we have to get them out of here or else they will go and eat from the middle of the garden, the tree of life, and live forever. And God didn't have a problem with us living forever. The problem that God had with us is living forever in a state of rebellion, living in a state of disobedience, living in a state of absolute separation from God. Who wants to live that kind of life? Who wants to live eternally from the presence of God? You know, when you have a little job, you have some money, you are healthy and things are going well. You, you have this uh, invincible attitude as though you don't need God right this minute. And let, let the bottom falls out. Let the doctor tell you, we see a mass on your lungs and it looks incurable. Let the doctor tell you the brain scan shows something lodging in your brain and we think that if it doesn't come out, you will become paralyzed. But the challenge is we can't get it out. Let your employer tell you that, uh, you know, you're fired. You can no longer work. Let the creditors start to call you. Let things start to go left side of the ocean, and then all of a sudden, you want to know if there is a power somewhere to help you. And that's when God becomes an important factor in your life. 
And I'm saying to you, don't let it go that way. And so because God knows that we cannot make it without him, God knows that we need him every step of the way. He said, no, I will not let them go and get that fruit to live forever in a state of sickness, in a state of rebellion, in a state of pain, in a state of sickness. No, if anything, God said, I will put you out just to restore you and bring you back. And when I bring you back, I will bring you into fellowship with me. I'm no longer going to trust you out here in some garden. I'm going to reconcile you to myself. Bring you into fellowship with me. And so God now has a whole new program. The program is where Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, God has a whole new program where the Holy Spirit now comes to indwell us, to keep us, to protect us, to guide us, to teach us, to convict us, to comfort us so that we can no longer. So the Holy Spirit now is in us. In some instances, like an alarm system. Where when we are going in the wrong direction, the Holy Spirit, you know, calls our attention. We need to know who Jesus is. It's not all about, Lord, bless me with this. Lord, bless me with that. Lord, bless me with the other. Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me. Yes. We can pray and ask God to bless our plans and bless us. But we need to know God. Because the more God we know, I'm telling the truth, the more we come to know ourselves. The more God we know, the more we know our capabilities. The more God we know, the more we come to know our divine abilities. Because we are God, spirit moving around here. You say, how so? Read the book. When God took the clay of the earth, the Bible said he breathed into the nostril the breath of life. We are the breath of life. We are God's spirit. We're the soul and we're God's body. But we got to know God. And not only do we have to know God, but we have to know Jesus. And so we don't need any kind of a funny kind of a understanding of Jesus Christ. We need to know the truth. And let the truth set us free. And so when we're talking about other religions and what they believe, we said that Judaism, that's a monotheistic religion, and monotheism means one God. The Jewish people, for the most part, Orthodox, you know, small, small, there's some changes, there's some breakthrough. But the Orthodox people, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Why do they not believe that? Because of social reason. Let me tell you why. During the days that when Jesus came to this earth, Israel Palestine, Jerusalem, whichever name you want to give it, was under the domination and the rulership of the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was not some kind of a rulership that allowed you to do what you want to do when you want to do it. Oh, no. They were strict. They were stern. You had to do it their way or they would crucify you. Yes. And so the Jewish people, for the most part, looked forward to a Messiah. Someone that God will send to liberate them, to set them free from this Roman 
domination. And for the most part, they were accustomed to a messiahship like that of David. You know, David was a warrior. He came to prominence when he killed Goliath. You didn't hear anything anywhere of Jesus killing anybody, much more insult them. No. But David came and David killed Goliath. And so the Jewish people now looking for a Messiah, they wanted somebody like a David. Let's get out here and kick some things down. Let's get out here and tear some things down. Let's get out here. And then what really, really messed things up was the kind of power Jesus had. I mean, Jesus could speak to the winds and the waves and they obeyed him. Jesus had the power to raise the dead. People died and he will raise them up. People were sick 38 years. He will get them back on their feet. You know the story about the woman with the issue of blood who had gone for some 12 years. I mean, literally spent every dime she had, everything she had, she gave it just for health. I'm telling you, health is a very important attribute. You know, <laughs> you can have all the money in the world, but if you're sick, it is not a pleasant feeling. You can be the most educated person on the planet. And if you're sick, it is not a pleasant feeling. You can have all the position in the world. And if you're sick, it's not a pleasant feeling. And Jesus went about healing people physically, even emotionally. Brokenhearted people, Jesus was healing them. He never, ever killed anybody. And when they saw Jesus with this kind of a power, this kind of authority, he could speak to the winds and the waves, turn water into wine, make the dead to rise again. They said, this guy should be a, he should be a pretty good Messiah. Okay. We're going to follow and see what he says here. But it went from day to day and Jesus was not talking about a military style of messiahship. He was talking something entirely different. And they wanted to know what, what's up with this? We need somebody to overthrow this Roman government. We don't need somebody coming up in here talking about turning the other cheek and all that kind of stuff. No. And so they said, this guy is not the messiah. It was not his works. It was because they wanted Jesus to do something political, social, cultural. Even in the very end, just before Jesus ascended to heaven, they said, excuse me, Jesus, uh, we have a little question we want to put to you. Will you at this time restore unto us the kingdom. We left our fishing nets. We left our low vocation. We, we left everything just to follow after you. Uh, are you going to, at this time, turn over the kingdom to us? And Jesus apparently must have disappointed them. Because all of this time, they are following Jesus, and they don't realize it's not about some type of a political power. And Jesus said, it is not for you to know those kinds of things. But what I do know is that you are going to receive power. And after that, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you are going to be my witnesses. 
you're going to begin right here in Jerusalem and you're going to go to Judea. You're going to go to Samaria. You're going to go to the ends of the world telling people about me. And, but he said this much. And uh, I think this is where most mainline churches miss the boat. You know, mainline churches like Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, all of those kind, they're all considered mainline churches. We didn't hear that message. We didn't hear what Jesus said. Jesus said, look, the kind of work I've done, you will do it too. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, greater works you're going to do. Jesus said, I want you to occupy until I come back. I want you to go to the ends of the world. But that's the big but. Jesus said, don't you go anywhere until you have received the Holy Spirit. You see, because my sisters and my brothers, this whole thing about Jesus, salvation, I want you to know this, it's a spiritual thing. It is a spiritual movement. It is not physical. It is not visible. It is spiritual. You can only see the outcome, but it is a spiritual movement. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 3, he said, except you be born of the spirit and of the water, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's a spiritual thing. And we didn't get it. We said it's a structural thing. It's a doctrinal thing. It's a denominational thing. It's a historical thing. And we went on and on with our thing instead of God's thing. And I have to take truth. Many, many of our mainline churches, you go in there and they're empty. A church that will seat 300 people and you have 40 people coming to church on Sunday morning. But then you go across the street and these people talking about the Holy Ghost and talking about the power of God, the healing, etc. They're packed. I hope the day will come that we will be realistic. We'll see, we'll read, we'll learn that listen, we too can grow. We too can be filled. We too can experience all kinds of miraculous things if we are willing to Listen to what Jesus said, and that is, wait for the Holy Spirit. So, the people followed Jesus, but they had a different motivation. They followed Jesus, some for the bread, some for the healing, some for the deliverance, some for the overthrow of the government. They followed Jesus for different reasons. And when they discovered Jesus was not about any of those things, they said, okay, sir, you got to go. You got to go. And that's how they crucified Jesus. Because he will not be the kind of Messiah that they wanted. And then to put the icing on the cake, they said, this guy said he is the son of God. And he even had the nerve to say he is God himself. And, you know, it's almost like what happened in the garden. In the garden, when you read Genesis chapter 3, the devil told Adam and Eve, did God tell you that if you were to eat the fruit, you will die? You won't die? No. You will not die. Let me tell you all the secret. The devil told him, what God knows is that the day you eat it, you'll be just like him. 
You won't die. He failed to tell them it was a spiritual death, not a physical death. What God said, if you eat it, you would die spiritually. There will be a disconnection. As Paul said into the Thessalonians, we are spirit, we are soul, and we are body. Body, soul, spirit. The spirit of God that is in you is like a receptacle, is like a conduit that receives from God and what the word comes to the spirit of God in you and it is filtered down to your soul and then your soul tells your body what to do. But when you sin, when you disobey God, when you rebel against God, then what happens? There's a disconnection. Try ironing your clothes and have the iron unplugged from the socket and see how well you iron your clothes. Very expensive iron. You bought it from Walmart. It costs 60 bucks. But you've decided I will press my clothes without plugging the iron into the receptacle. And that's what we do when we try to live our life without the power of God. So when we talk about Jesus and he being God, we're not saying that when you see Jesus bodily, physically, and the beards and the hair and all of that, that's how God looks. No. When we say that Jesus is God, we are saying that the attributes of God. How many people you know perform over 37 miracles of all types? Of all types. Read the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 37 plus miracles Jesus performed of all types over nature when he would speak to the winds and the waves and they would obey him. Walking on the waters. I mean, just speaking to people and leprosy gets healed. Raising the dead. Giving sight to the blind. How many prophets you know did that? And then to really make it Powerful. He was crucified. But then the third day he got up. The third day he got up. With all power in his hands. So when Judaism denies that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Jesus is God. We need to understand what does the Bible say. Because remember now. Eternal life. <laughs> I'm not sure if we give it some thought, lift it, but eternal life, this is what Jesus said, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Mm -hmm. This is life eternal. So what Jesus is saying, that, this eternal life that all of us would desire. One of the ways to get eternal life. Is to. Actually come. To know God. Now you, you got to understand something now. When you come to know God. It means you come to know the character of God. You come to know the holiness of God. You come to know the righteousness of God. You come to know the mercifulness of God. You come to know that God is a forgiving God. And the more you know these things. And the more you take on the character of God. You subordinate the life of the flesh. And you exalt the life of the spirit in you. And so when we talk about Jesus Christ being the son of God and Jesus being God, 
We're not saying that Jesus, the physical man, is God. No. Mm -mm. You know, someone said they read, they read the Bible to find out where Jesus said he was God and they didn't find it. They must have been not looking properly. Because Jesus said it. If you send it, if you send me, you send the Father. I and the Father are one. And what Jesus is saying is that the power that is in me, the authority that is in me. You know, you take, for example, when uh, a police officer stops you on the highway. The only reason why you stop because of the color of the light on the car because of the uniform he or she is wearing, because of the badge that they have on, the car, the uniform, the badge that they have represent something. They represent something, the law. That's why you stop. So this image, this figure called Christ Jesus inside of him was something that represented almighty God. And so we find in the book of Colossians, we find in the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, for in him, I want you to imagine a Coca-Cola bottle. The bottle means nothing without the cook that is inside. If you are a Coke person, or maybe you're a, person, a Pepsi person, or maybe you're a ginger ale person, you're a Fanta person, you're a grip person, the bottle means nothing. It's what's in the bottle that makes the difference. It's what's in the bottle that makes it credible, important, significant. And so Colossians just says, for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. What do you mean here? What does he mean here? What is Paul saying to the Colossians? Paul is saying when you see Jesus in Jesus, in him, the whole, the fullness of deity, that is God, dwells bodily. You have the cook, you have the bottle, but inside the cook, there's a liquid. And that liquid has ingredients. And what Paul is saying, that in this body is a spirit. And in that spirit is the ingredient of almighty God. And what, what is it of God that he's talking about? Let's look at it very quickly. So when Paul says here that in him is the fullness, he's talking about his attributes. In Christ, you find the attributes of God. And what are these attributes? They include God's character. You find it in Christ. His perfection in Christ did no sin. In Christ, his holiness. In Christ, his power. In Christ, his love. Yes. The fullness of God is his, his complete nature. And you find it in Jesus Christ. His character, his perfection, his holiness, his power, his love, his mercy in Christ. The cook just doesn't have that brownish looking water. That water has ingredients. When you have some time, take your Coca-Cola bottle and look on it and see the different ingredients that are in it. The same it is with Jesus. 
in Jesus, the spirit that was in Christ has the perfection of God, has the holiness of God, has the power of God, has the love of God. In him dwells the fullness. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will teach us to understand these things. If you say, I don't need the Holy Spirit, you are saying, essentially, I want to understand what's at the bottom of the ocean when I'm going on the top of a mountain. And you will never, ever know what's at the bottom of the ocean by being on the top of the mountain. On the top of the mountain, that's historic. On the top of the mountain, that's fantastic. But you will never, ever get to know what's at the bottom of the ocean. The same it is with us. We we'll never ever get to know and understand anything about God until the Holy Spirit is present in our lives. So the Jewish people had a problem with Jesus because they say he was not the son of God. But the Bible tells us in him was the fullness of God. That's what it means when you say Jesus is God. That is, in him, the whole, the fullness of the deity of God dwells in him. Anybody can take color water and put it in a bottle and call it cook. But it is only when the ingredients are in that color water, it becomes coke cola. It's only when you are able to see God's character, God's perfection, God's holiness, God's power, God's love in a person you can tell that this person knows something about God. So when we're talking to a Jewish person and they say that Jesus is not God, he's not the son of God, take them to such a scripture as this and show them in him dwell the fullness of the power of God. And if you want to understand what that means, look at the miracles over 37 miracles. How did Jesus do it? He said, because I and the Father are one. What he was saying, the power that the Father has is in me. It's not just the iron that presses your clothes. It's that you have it in the plug, in the receptacle, and the power in there gets into the iron, heats it up, and causes you to be able to iron your clothes. And it looks neat. It looks clean. It looks wonderful. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, can make us look like Christ, look like God. Because in us, the character, the power, the love of God dwells. That's what it means when we say that Jesus is God. Amen? I will stop here. And it's very important now. Don't forget, because... The scripture tells us in John 17 and 3, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We got to know Jesus. We got to know him, who he is. That's eternal life.